Hey, this is Nolly from GGD, and today we're going to be taking a kind of in-depth look at our new GGD Studio Cabs plugin, which is called Cali Oversize. And I have the help of my wonderful friend Rabia here, who you may know as the biggest guitar icon of the decade <laughs> after his uh, headlining amazing solo at the Reading Festival recently, which is pretty incredible. So uh, it's a true pleasure to have him here to demonstrate some of the tones within the plugin, and also hopefully we can get into a little bit of a chat too about you know, how we'd go about miking up cabs, our experiences with the, the types of cabs which you find in this plugin. So to give a little bit of kind of an overview of the Kali Oversized plugin, it uses the same infrastructure as the first in our series, which was the Zilla Cabs plugin. So you've got an array of channels which are set out a bit like a, a studio mixer. You've got seven channels and uh, within the plugin, you can load up, uh, there's six different cabs here and they're all based on this kind of famous Cali oversized 412 and they all have V30 type speakers in them as well which might seem like a bit of an interesting decision because some people might think that they're all going to sound the same however having spent several years doing a lot of really deep kind of tone hunting and searching for the holy grail guitar tone I discovered that there's a, there's a huge variation in the way that these speakers can sound and if you go back to the kind of era of, of production of these cabs around the kind of mid 90s to the early 2000s. It's just this sound, which I don't know about you, but for me, the sound of those cabs just, it was the sound of heavy guitar that I got into when I started listening to heavy music, when I started playing guitar. I mean, I'm thinking of like new metal bands, like yeah. kind of like Linkin Park and stuff like that, Korn even. Uh, and then as I got into kind of heavier music and there was like the metalcore things going on. Or Kill know. Switch. Exactly. That was yeah. a big one for me, the guitar sound there. Yeah, kill switch trivium. Yeah, ascendancy is a killer tone as well. And I don't know about you, but like once I started reading up about guitar gear, it was like there was some very common pieces of gear that were used on those records. And one of these kind of Cali four by twelves was almost always kind of yeah. what was producing the sound. Was that the same thing for you? Yeah, I mean, what's funny for me was that. I get, became way more um, aware of all this stuff much later on, uh, listening to that music and wanting to play it, but then coming back to it as a more knowledgeable person about how they achieve those things. So for me, it would have been, I just assumed old speakers were better. you know. So when you say the mid nineties kind of V30 era for me, in my head, I would have gone, oh, the older they are, the, the better they sound. But I think there's obviously way more of an explanation to it. But I think I share that similarity there in that I always went for older speed. Like my first main cab was a really old uh, mid eighties Marshall cab. And I used to love it cause it sounded so worn in, but I think mm. it was just the generation of speaker. I'm not really sure, you know. It's a tough one to decode and we won't go too far down the rabbit hole here about that. But yeah, I mean, the more used the speaker is generally the kind of darker and smoother it gets mm. until it kind of falls off a cliff and it sounds just, <laughs> just rubbish. So yeah. there's definitely a point where it gets too old. And in sourcing the cabs for this plugin, I, I mean, I. This is, I, I'm not over exaggerating when I say this was like really a labor of love. It was a couple of years of collecting cabs and trying to record them in the most scientific way to assess every speaker, like, you know, all four speakers in each 412, but then also shifting them around to different positions because these are angled cabs and the angled speakers just by virtue of being in an angle in the enclosure sound different. Mm. So sometimes there might be like an amazing sounding speaker in the bottom position, you put it in the top and it doesn't sound as great or vice versa. And um, I mean, had well over a dozen of these cabs at one point, and uh, as well as lots of other cabs, and was just collecting up every V30 I found on the internet that was from this period. So like, this really is a distillation of like a, an obsessive tone hunt. And I think we use the word obsessive a lot <laughs> yeah. within GGD and within- it's Justified. Uh, yeah, I think yeah. with this one, th this really was the result of obsession. And for me, it's super cool that it's, it's now actually something I don't have to obsess over. And it's kind of the products there. Um, I'm really proud of how it sounds. And we'll get into the sounds in a second. And um, I think I was saying just before this, this, this might actually be the, the product that I'm proudest of that we've done with GGD. Because for me, it, it's like I'm finding these amazing sounding speakers, like the specific ones and miking them up just right was, was the end of my tone hunt that started from when I started playing guitar. So I mean, that is saying something. Cool. So coming back to the, the product itself, we've got the, um, the seven channels, as I mentioned earlier, we've got six different cabs and um, I'll show you here on the screen. At the moment, this is set up like it would load up as a default when you open the plugin. So the default cab is the one which we've called Massive. Uh, there are six cabs, like I mentioned, and I've given them each a kind of descriptive name, which 
would have been like a single adjective that stuck out to me when I was assessing these speakers and deciding to capture them for uh, for this cab plug-in because otherwise you just get lost. They're all the same speaker type. And I mean, I was keeping notes of like the serial numbers and stuff, but I don't think anyone wants to be deciding which cab they want based on the serial number of the speaker. So uh, Massive is the one that loads up. And um, to me, this is like just a great starting point because when I got this cab, that was that was like like boom basically yeah. that's my that's my tone hunt over so um the master cab is the default one we've got up front we've got thick smooth guttural and detailed and these are all the same cab type and all speaker types so they do have similarities you're going to find like especially the, the low end content mm. is quite similar with all of them but they all have quite a different kind of tonal fingerprint different mids and different top end and i think they all sound really good but you might find that you gravitate towards one or that you really enjoy blending a couple or that for one project you use one and then you decide to change things up the next time. And that's why we decided to give you six options instead of it just being one cab, which maybe you really like, but everyone else is using that same cab or, you know, you kind of are looking for something new after a time. So six cabs in the plugin and we're going to get into the tones. Rabir's going to do some lovely demonstrations. <laughs> um, we have eight microphones. Well, eight microphone options. One of them, uh, which is the Fredman microphone option, involves two 57s, of which we also have an independent SM57 option. We've also got both the vintage and the modern versions of the 421 microphone because they're drastically different in sound. This is not a conspiracy. Literally, Sennheiser changed the voicing for the two. Mm. Um, and both of them have been used for guitar sounds for several decades. So they're both really valid options. And you'll, you'll hear they sound quite different. We've got uh, two ribbons in the form of the 160 and also the 121, which are really popular options. I know you, you I like love the 121. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Do you like the, the 160 as well? I do, but I find it's, for me the 121, it's the to it's literally the top end. It, I prefer the the, fit, the sound of it. It's mm. smoother for me. Yeah. Well, we'll get to showing off these sounds and people can kind of can hear what's going on. And we've also got a couple of condensers as well. We've got a large diaphragm 414 and a small diaphragm 184. Now, all of these microphones are captured with a sweet spot of position. So unlike in the Zilla Cabs plugin, which had a knob at the bottom of the GUI here that was blending between a close and a far position. Mm. And with Zilla, the idea was it was not so genre specific. You might want to use it for kind of indie tones, capturing quite a lot of ambience with the microphone further back. With this, we've gone very much down the route of sticking to close miking, tight sounding recording. So all these cabs are recorded in like an ISO booth. Okay. So there's like no reflections there at all. Obviously you can add reverb if you want to uh, or, or delay, but essentially they're, they're designed so that if you want to use them for super tight rhythm sounds, mm. there's no kind of room reflections in there at all. It's just ultra tight. So instead of doing a close and far position, we did a dark and bright position. So I spent a long time and I mean, I've, I can't tell you how many times I've even like reshot the impulses which are in this plugin. Like I, I thought I had it good, and then I, late one Saturday night, I'd be like, "You know what? I reckon I can do it better." And oh, like, no. I'd like <laughs> and so, so basically, over lots of experimentation, I, I like found where I thought was like the brightest and darkest usable point mm. on the speaker. Now we're talking a small range, really, and it, it's all falling around that kind of typical like like edge of the edge of the uh, the speaker dust cap mm -hmm. but it's quite different from one cab to another for example the massive cab it's really dark when you've got the sm57 set all the way bright it's almost in the middle right and with this cab it doesn't sound fizzy however with just again we'll get into the tones but just to explain like the guttural cab is quite bright but the brightest position there is like on the edge of the dust cap and when it goes to the darkest it's way darker than i'd ever usually use so right and these sweet spot positions are different for every microphone for every cab. So the idea is that you've only got good sounding options, basically. Any way you set that, it's gonna be cool. But if it's all the way to the darker side, it's gonna be a bit more of that more rolled off, kind of like shushier top end. Yeah. And if you go to the brighter side, it might be a little bit fizzier, but I've, I've not pushed it to the point where it's actually fizzy. It's just gonna have a bit more kind of aggressive bite to it. But depending on your taste and how you're blending the microphones and the microphone, you, you know, you might find that there's a whole range of different sounds that you like within that knob. Um, just a couple of other points. You've got, you know, your standard kind of console options here of a, a mute and solo and also a phase reverse. Now, all these impulses are in phase with one another uh, within the plugin. But if you're bringing in your own third party IRs, you might find that it, it sounds better one way or the other. Mm. We can't really 
you know, we can't allow for the fact that every third party IR is going to be phase compatible with this because there are lots of different standards. But mm. the way we've done this should be compatible with most of the, the major brand right, okay. um, IRs out there. But I mean, it's our hope that you'll find what you need within this plugin. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and if you do, you can actually export as well. There's an export um, function over here. You can export 500 millisecond or 1000 millisecond. I love that feature. That's fantastic. It's pretty cool, isn't you know, it? Cause... Taking it to live, you know, because I run in ears. And if I've been using that particular cab preset at home that I really love, I can just export it and put it into my in-ear rig because I run like a little, you know, so that I can run my own IRs for my in-ears. Yeah. So that's that's great. Yeah, and lots of people, you know, might have rack-mounted digital modelers mm. or like a load box for their amp that they want to just have a sound coming into their, their door with no plug-in, just like a final guitar sound. Obviously, there's different requirements depending on the unit mm. like some of them require really short irs shorter than 500 milliseconds in which case you're gonna have to you know open up that file in your door and shorten it down to the requirement um we can't really account for every single option out there but we wanted to make sure that you've got the option to get really high quality irs yeah. out of this one and then apart from just the standard input and output level here uh, there's this master eq switch which is a subtle but quite cool little function where basically it's doing some subtle EQ on the cab. It's, it's filtering the top and the bottom end a bit like you normally would. Mm -hmm. There's nothing which is drastically changing the sound, but it's a bit more like what you might just throw on um, automatically, like kind of cutting off the extreme highs and lows. Right. Yeah, that's nice. Top and tail. Yeah. And on top of that, you've got a little bit of a low mid cut. Okay. Which tends to be something that people do. It brings out a bit more clarity. I find when I'm jamming, I like to leave that off. Yeah. Because of the thicker sound just feels a bit more satisfying to play. But when it comes to the mix, it's usually like, actually, no, it is better on. Especially in the heavier genres, I think, as well, that low mid tends to happen when you're putting a lot of gain in there. Because you want the thump, but when you're mixing, you want to tame that a bit. So Yeah. And when you've got the bass guitar in there as well, sometimes yeah. it's like, you know, you're tracking and there's no bass in there yet and it sounds great. But then there's not so much space when you do want to have the yeah. bass. Uh, and on top of that, there's actually for every cab a little bit of very specific notching EQ. Cool. Um, so when you switch that on, it's actually going to take away some of the, the more whistly or shrieky frequencies, which are present in any speaker. There's mm. no perfectly flat speaker, and it'd probably sound a bit boring if it yeah. did. Um, but switching that on will reduce the kind of worst offenders there mm. by quite a subtle amount. So the idea really is when you, when you flick that switch, you're not going to hear a drastic change in the character of the cab that you're listening to. So it's one to mess with perhaps after the fact. Mm. Um, I also find it's more noticeable if you've got a pair of double tracked guitars, sometimes a single mono guitar. It's not quite as obvious, but, but when you pan them out to the side, you really get a perception of like, oh, the guitars have suddenly come that much mm. more close to me or, you know, suddenly that that fatiguing frequency is, is relieved and it's like, here he is, just get a little rest or something. But one of the most famous things about these cabs is that they just record so well. So, yeah. you know, you might find actually you don't need that at all. And I did a demo song for this this plugin that I'm sure will be on YouTube by the time this is out. And I, I just used the default preset with nothing. No further EQ, no top-down EQ, and that's the guitar sound on that. Um, so it's a testament to the quality of the cabs, really. But you've got that option there if you want. So something that Rabia mentioned just when we were talking earlier is, like, his realisation of how important the speaker in the cab is in your tone. Yeah. And I think that's a realization I've had along my journey as mm. well. And I think actually modelers, like using modeling uh, units for my guitar tones is something that turned me on to that because you, you've got like the cab section, you flick through all the different cabs mm. and it's like, wow, every cab is like a whole different world sonically where sometimes changing amps. Yeah, it's a good, I, I agree. It's less noticeable. You take the same cab, two different amps and as long as they're in the same ballpark sort of design wise it's less of a drastic thing i think especially when you get more gain involved in in, in the sound but yeah i remember having my old marshall and going into a much much cheaper cab and it just i almost fell out of love with my amp i was like i didn't know it could sound that bad and that turned me on to how important it is to make sure you've got a good quality speaker cab uh, and like you say to echo what you were just saying now in the modeling world and the fact we can do so much of this from home and then you, you can literally go in and change the cab setting as many times as you want and it just completely changed the sound is is for me is when I was switched on to actually I found my amp tones I know what kind of amp tones I like so I'm always going to gravitate towards those style of amps whereas the cab is going to make a big difference whether I want a lead tone I want it to be smoother or I want really aggressive 
you know, or if I'm playing like a single chord guitar, I don't want to use the same cab necessarily because it might just accentuate so many of the frequencies inherent in a single chord guitar and gain that are going to be harsh, you know? I think it's a really important conversation about gain, actually. Because mm. my theory is like the more gain you use, I don't mean like whether you use it on six or ten, but I mean mm. like if you're a high gain player, mm. the emphasis of what's, let me think about how to word this correctly, like the thing that's defining the EQ of your guitar sound gets shifted further down the chain mm. to like the, the cab and the microphone because when you hear what's coming out of a distorted guitar amp with no cab, mm. like if you've got a load box like we have and you run it in and you don't have a plug-in like this, yeah. it's just crazy. It's yeah. like all the frequencies and it sounds rubbish. Mm. So basically yeah. what the cab's doing is filtering. It's actually kind of reductive. Like it's, yeah. it's taking away stuff to leave you with this kind of chiseled out landscape of a guitar EQ. And that's what defines whether your guitars really sit in the mix with the other instruments well, or whether it conveys, um, yeah, it's kind of like how, how it sounds to your ears, like how it, how it kind of feels on your body, all these kinds of things. Whereas if you ever mess with like an EQ pedal in front of your amp, mm. you, can like, you can do crazy things with that EQ. And while it might give the kind of character of the attack a, a strange character, mm. it never changes the overall EQ that much, really. No. Um, so, you know, when we get to demonstrating the guitar tones that you can get out of this plugin, I think it's going to make sense to start with a high gain tone because that's when you really hear, the, you know, the extent of the, the different filtering characters of these, of these cabs and microphones. And sometimes clean players, you know, if you, if you literally just play a clean amp, like a telly into a, into a little combo, like your pickup's doing way more of the defining of the actual EQ mm. that you hear. You know what I mean? Like you really yeah. hear whether... A, a pickup's darker or brighter with that with that kind of um, that kind of setup. Whereas with a high gain setup, it's like it's more kind of affecting the character of the attack or like the the response, the feel as a player, which is super important. But. Yeah, I, and I also think it's funny, and it's probably because I've spent m way more years engineering or like getting my own tones in heavier music. But mm. if I was going to go and get Michael Bacab or listen to it, I'd be wanting to hear the gain. To then hear exactly what where the mic is on the cab, as opposed to if it, the cleaner it gets, and I'm sure there are hundreds and thousands of engineers out there that prefer it that way. But for me, I have to have the gain there to really hear what the microphone's picking up. If that yeah. makes sense. Well, there's quite a common trick of people actually putting pink noise through the amp, mm. so it's just like you know, like a white noise generator kind of thing. So you have a completely consistent all the frequencies happening. Yeah. So when you sweep around the microphone, you really hear it sounding like, almost like a kind of phaser. I did um, not know that. Yeah, that's something I've done quite a lot as well. You have to watch the the level sometimes, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but but yeah, that, that can be a really good way of doing it. But if the amp's distorted enough, yeah, you, it, you probably don't need to go down that route. But then I guess on the other side, if you're not playing with a distorted tone, maybe, well, I, well I'm going to go out and say it, I think the mic position is not as important. You heard it here I first. It, yeah, <laughs> you can kind of eyeball it to a sensible position, and you know it's going to sound fine. Yeah, I guess it's maybe more of what I'm saying. Yeah, rather than you just chuck it yeah, anywhere, just near. hang it in front of the mesh somewhere. <laughs> but you know, like I'm describing about doing this this uh, this plug in these IRs, or if you talk to any producer that does heavy guitar tones, you'll mm. know that they spend a lot of time with a flashlight looking through the grill, finding the exact spot for the microphone, and then going back into the control room and hearing it and then making adjustments. And oh, it's microscopic, isn't it? Some of the adjustments, but the difference it makes. Yeah. yeah. Cool. So I think we've talked enough about the plugin because a lot of these things, you're just going to need to hear them to, to know what we're talking about and to make up your own mind about whether this is a, you know, a cool uh, kind of cab simulator for your purposes. So I'm going to get Rabia to do some playing. And I think it makes sense to start with a high gain tone like we were talking about. And there is probably no greater place to start for this kind of cabinet than with a block letter PV5150 with a green overdrive pedal boosting it. So let's start there, shall we? Yes, let's start there. <laughs> I, I think that perfectly exemplifies why when I got this cab and mic'd it, and this was one of the last cabs I got after having gone through a lot, 
I thought I'd found ones where I was like, yeah, that's the sound. <laughs> but then I got this one and I mic'd it up and I was like, yeah, that's the sound. Yeah, that's the sound. <laughs> that's the sound. <laughs> There's a certain sort of, particularly when you're digging in, that... Oh, yeah. It's authentic is the word I want to use. I'm glad you think so because so many of the cabs which I tried, even after I kind of narrowed down like literally the serial numbers in the cabs that mm. I thought were going to be the, the range that sounded good, there was still a wild variation in the sounds. And there was only certain ones which made me, that kind of made my ears perk up and go like, that sounds like a particular record or yeah. for whatever reason, that's like hitting me in the feels. <laughs> like, yeah. like I'm getting emotional hearing that in a way where it's like it gives you the gurn or like the, the, the tears of gain. Yeah. <laughs> to be fair, there's a lot of truth in that though when you said about records, that sounds like the record because, you know, ultimately our reference points are things that inspired us what we listen to right yeah so there's a there's a reference point in your brain that's like that's like ingrained from years of loving those tones and sounds and records and everything like that that's your ears are going to spike up but when you hear that even if it's a, just a certain element or characteristic of it which is basically what you're explaining there yeah. it's bringing that kind of oh that's the thing that got me excited about that yeah you know I don't know about for you, but for me, it's like, it feels like having had something on the tip of my tongue for like 15 years and then remembering the word <laughs> yeah. where you're like, that's the thing, that, that's yeah, the yeah, thing yeah. I want in this whole time. So. Yeah, I can imagine that's that's pretty epic feeling must be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, it's great. And, and you know, just having the plugin to mess around with now, for, even for me, um, just makes me so happy. So um, this is how this cab sounds with the, um, the mic position on the dark, bright knob set just in the middle, mm -hmm. which to me would be just a great starting point. Yeah. And, you know, over the years, I've heard so many producers talk about how, like, oh, you just get an SM57 and put it in the right spot. And it sounds like, you know, X record. It sounds incredible. <laughs> yeah. I could never make those things add up entirely. I, I could get good sounds, but they never sound as great as I, as I wanted. But mm. once you've got the right cab and speaker, you really can do that. Like, and th this is one of those, those ones for sure. So all of the speakers in here, I think, sound great with just an SM57 on them. Mm -hmm. So before we get into the different microphone sounds, it might make sense to kind of just go through yeah. the speakers. So that's massive. Okay. I like this one because it's... Massive. There you go. But it's got like quite a sharp drop-off at the top. So it never sounds fizzy. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? It's got like the kind of the bite, which sounds so good for the, the chugging. Mm -hmm. And then it rolls off quite quickly. Yeah, that's, that's my usual go-to is something with a more of a roll-off, Yeah, I think personally so uh, yeah i like to feel the bark and the 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 aggression when you dig in so and that's yeah it's doing it nicely there so yeah in fact before we try another cab let's show you let's kind of show people what the the dark to bright knob control mm -hmm. does so if i can get you to do something simple like just a repetitive chug or something yep. just so that there's not nothing too distracting from okay. the tone and i'll just i'll move that knob <laughs> And if you're just to chug solidly, like just letting it ring. Yeah, there's definitely, you can hear that quite clearly. Yeah, but it's, for me, it's just the, the right usable range, really. It's like, I'm not trying to give anything that could sound bad. And it's just really how much of that, that little aggression on the top do you want? That's going to be quite amp dependent, you know what I mean? It yeah. Could, or how you set your amp. It could be that for one session you use it as dark as it can go and you've got a bit more treble or presence on the amp and then maybe the next session, you know, you've got more mids and, and low end or whatever and you actually want to turn it a bit brighter. What I liked really nicely about that there was when you put it to bright and it was so definitely a 57 listening to a 5150. Like... <laughs> you could quite clearly hear that character in the very top end, the presence, the, the sort of fizz of the 5150, that having that on full bright sounded like the 57 really picking up, the 57, I call it the 57 rattle. Okay. That yeah. 57 has. Right. And the two were just accentuated because you put it on bright. And mm. what I'm trying to say is it was really accurate in terms of the sound. I could have been listening to that in real life. Oh, that's sick. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, that's cool. And it's funny, I, I think uh, my friend Josh Middleton from Architects and Silosis, who, to be fair, I owe a gratitude of thanks to because he was with me on this journey. We were WhatsApping daily about nice. cabs and speakers, <laughs> which is pretty funny. Um, I think he describes that as crumbly. Really? I mean, I think he, he gets it like a, it's more a rectifier thing. Okay. A rectifier has like a crumbly top. I don't kind of okay. know what he means. Like, 
Maybe yeah. you need to hear the tone to, to... Rattle, crumble. Yeah, strange things, isn't yeah. it? These words that come out. So um, I'm going to set that back to the midpoint and we're going to listen to some different cabs. So that's probably one of the darkest cabs. Right. And we're going to jump all the way probably to the brightest one. Okay. And bearing in mind that that mic position, as I say, is quite central mm -hmm. and this next one's way off, it's still going to be quite a lot brighter. It gives you an idea of the range of potential brightness that you get within these speakers. Okay. So if you want to do a bit of playing, I'll actually change it in real time so that you hear that happen. Sweet. Okay. So that's, that, lovely. that's actually the oldest speaker that's okay. in this plugin. So we were talking earlier about old speakers sounding darker, mm. but this is where just the gradual changes in the voicing of the speaker really come into play. Because this is a really well used speaker right. from the early 90s, actually. And yet it's got so much more top end. So this yeah, shows you the kind of range of tones, even when you're in the sweet spot. It can mm. be so infuriating when you compare your tone to someone else that's got a similar cab and speaker and yours sounds completely different. Yeah. It might be valid, but for me, that kind of like, I don't know what's happening here. And the I, mystery. I want to know. It's yeah. just like, it ruins yeah. me. <laughs> yeah, no, that I can imagine that was quite stressful. But is it, the thing is, you've done all the hard work for everyone else now. I guess so. So um, we, we can all enjoy the fruits of your labor. <laughs> me too. I can just erase that yeah. part of my, of my memory. Yeah. Um, so this, this is, I've called it guttural. Yeah. And that's kind of, it's got something to do with the mids of it, actually. Mm. For me, it's kind of got, uh, God, people are going to joke because I used this word a couple of times and now everyone quotes it. I, this is quite a throaty sounding. Throaty. <laughs> Throats. Uh, I like the throaty as an adjective for guitar tones, to be fair. Yeah. And guttural kind of feels like it's part of that, doesn't it? Like, yeah. Um, so it's, it's quite a characterful cab, and especially when you double track it, mm. you notice that the mid range is not like as kind of linear as some of the other cabs. Like it's got a bit more of a kind of like honk in the middle of it. Right. Okay. And to me, that sounds a bit like a like a Petrucci kind of tone, or I'm trying to think what other bands have that, but maybe like the kind of audio hammer metal bands, mm -hmm. like kind of like your White Chapels and your okay. Um, oh gosh, they're kind of failing me. Some of the bands. Anyway, there's like a, a certain sound and. It's funny because a lot of it's actually to do with whether the speaker's in the bottom or the top of an angled cab. Right. Because if the speaker's in the bottom, and this is a bottom one, okay. you get this weird relationship because of how the speaker's perpendicular to the back. The baffle's actually moving quite a lot because they're kind of in direct right. relationship. So you get a point where the speaker's going and the baffle's going in the opposite direction. So you actually get like a phase cancellation at a certain point in the mids which is related to the pressure buildup in the case. This is super geeky, but hopefully it's easy to understand. Do you know when I said you did the fruits of the labor for everyone, <laughs> this is exactly what I'm talking about. I mean, that is detail. Yeah, I mean, and this is something which gets applied to any cab, really. Yeah. The more perpendicular, sorry, not perpendicular, the more parallel mm. the baffle and the back are, the more of this effect you get, and like the more floppy the baffle is. So small cabs are really tight. Mm -hmm. They've only got a tiny bit of kind of flex in them. Whereas right. big cabs like a 412, if you have a straight 412, that baffle's got a lot of potential movement in it. Right. So you get this like, this out of phase thing that happens in the mid-range and then immediately after an in phase thing. And that's where that kind of, what I describe as a non-linear mid-range comes from. You get this resonant peak in the middle of the mid-range. That's um, really interesting. <laughs> and if you've got a straight cab, that's in all four positions. Okay. But I like angled cabs because you get a bit of an option. You might like that sound. You can mic the bottom speakers. If you mic the top speakers, because they're not parallel, they don't really get anywhere near as much of that effect. Right. So you get a much more flat mid-range. And for me, in a mix, that just makes the guitars go bam. They're like, there's no... Yeah, they, they just sound so present all the time. Um, so with that in mind, let's go from guttural, which is one of the cabs that most exemplifies this kind of mm -hmm. technically phasey, but still desirable mid-range. Yep. Um, and let's jump to the one which I've called up front. Okay. Because that is a top speaker IR, or a set of IRs, so in the top position. And this cab, for me, fulfilled my my metalcore fantasies of guitar tone. Oh, okay, <laughs> cool. This is, <laughs> this is, you know, for me, exemplifies that like kind of Andy Sneet, Colin Richardson guitar tone. Okay. Um, so again, I'll let you play and then I'll click onto up front. And 
going between these two cabs is going to be quite a stark difference. OK. Oh. oh, it's great. Yeah, I love that one. I mean, for me, Upfront and Massive, they're my two favourites. I, I had to have favourites. Those are the two <laughs> cabs. I got, I, I got the Massive cab and I was like, that's my search done. And then I had an opportunity to swap one of the cabs I didn't like as much with someone else. Right, okay. And I thought it was going to be a good sounding cab, but I was like, you know, I'd just rather have one that's in the ballpark that I prefer more. And it, it was the Upfront cab. And I mic'd it up and I was just like... Yeah. There are two holy grails after all. <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> yeah. it, was, it was pretty cool. So, so the upfront cab is, um, for me, yeah, one of my absolute favourites. What's amazing about this is that you've done three different cabs now, haven't touched the mic, gotten all that variety. Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, there's, there's always a risk when you're making these things public. Because, you know, if you have your own cab, it's kind of personal to you. Mm. If you just capture that one cab and put it out there, it's a bit like, everyone's going to have that sound. I don't even mean that like you want to have ownership of it, but mm. they're going to feel like it's kind of your sound as well. Yeah. And I they're also going to feel like it's everyone else's sound that's using that. So it was really important for me to do this plugin and to give lots of options. Because the other thing is it's cool to do like, you know, one SM57 on a cab. Mm. That sounds great. But you do that a few times and you start going like, well, what can I do differently to get a different result this time? Mm. And that's where like blending microphones, blending different cabs, gets you to sounds that you wouldn't get any other way. And you probably couldn't get again, frankly. You know, if you yeah. had to tear it down and put it all back together, there's a complexity there that gives it a uniqueness. So mm. we'll get into blending cabs in this, but that's, you know, one of my favorite things with this is I feel like people can really blend and find unique sounds and kind of make it their own. And, and that's that's my hope anyway. And, almost sa and also save those combinations and settings, yeah. you know. So. Yeah, whether it's saved in the plugin or like exported as yeah. a single IR file. And, can use it on other other platforms. We live in the future. We do. It's fair to say. We do, yeah. Yeah, it's amazing, actually. I, if I could have had this. I keep thinking <laughs> that when I'm using this stuff and I go, man, if I could have had this back in the day, like, it'd been so cool, but, you know. I, I genuinely wonder if I'd have even become a producer. Like, Probably not, I would say. I because, mean, when you think about it, in a way, because it's all part of the journey, isn't it? And this is a product of your journey. So it's kind of like, yeah. And it's like, it's ultimately born of frustration, as much as I hate to say it. Like, yeah. trying to write music and being, oh, it doesn't sound the way I want it to. Yeah. And being like, why doesn't it sound the way I want it to? And that's obviously part of my personality to obsess over that. But at the same time, I would have probably written loads more music <laughs> and just <laughs> yeah. gotten on with it, you know? All right, so that's the upfront cab. And, I mean, I just love it. We'll come, up, we'll come back and do some kind of mic blends, maybe yep. using this one, because for me, that's one of the real crowning achievements within this pack let's go from up front to thick okay. because thick is the latest is like the most modern of the cabs it's, it's still only 2003 sorry 2004 that one um and it's got some of the characters of what happened to the voicing of the v30 later but it hasn't gone too far i sound like okay. i'm describing wines or something <laughs> right now but, but basically they start to get a bit more industrial sounding mm. i say whether the, uh, the top end gets a bit more kind of metallic okay. and a bit more whistly, but you can notch it out and get a really aggressive sound. Mm. And, you know, I've still included it in this because I think it's very cool. But again, it's quite a strong counterpoint to some of these other ones. Okay. So once more, uh, get you to play and then I'll switch. And I'll also say this is a bottom speaker IR. So okay. you're going to get that, that mid-range thing, slightly more Petrucci-y, I guess, is okay. maybe what we're going for. But maybe the top end isn't particularly Petrucci, we'll see. still really it's usable good. yeah it's pretty it's like very angry sounding yeah that's what um, i thought again it, going back to the throaty yeah adjective but it is it's 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 got that about it the 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 intense mids yeah 
And I think that's why I've called it thick. Mm. Because although I could have called it like metallic or something, I feel like that would have been selling it short because what it does have is like a, a certain low mid that sounds really full. Yeah, metallic would be suggesting we're listening more or needing to focus more on the top end of, yeah. of the speaker sound there. So. Yeah, and that, this is one where with the Master EQ, you'll notice that those, those whistly frequencies kind of fall back quite a lot. It right. becomes a bit smoother. So in fact, this would be a good one to demonstrate. I know this is not necessarily a dedicated spot to talk about it, but if you do a bit of playing, I'll, I'll demonstrate what happens when you engage and disengage the Master okay. EQ. Yeah, yeah, that, and you can tell that that's going to be super useful just to turn it on and off, not actually having to load up other plugins and do all sorts of other stuff, just a quick AB. Yeah, yeah, I'm glad you think so. And you know, it's subtle on this cab, it's probably the most vivid, yeah, but with a lot of the cabs, it's subtle and it's the kind of thing where, yeah, you know, track without it and then switch it in. It's the kind of thing where I would end up, I'd there, be there with my guitar tracks and I'd open up my, my EQ and I'd start notching stuff out and messing around. And then you'd AB it with that and it'd be, you know, you're doing more or less the same thing, yeah. aren't you really? So. And I do think less is more oftentimes with these things. It's easy to completely kind of neuter a guitar tone by doing too much notching on it. And then it ends up sounding, it ends up sounding like what people criticize modelers for sounding like, yeah. which is not necessarily an accurate thing to say about modelers in general, but you know, especially some of the earlier IRs and the earlier modelers had this kind of fake smoothness and you yeah. can get there if you over EQ like a real cab as well. So um, that's a nice feature. I mean, as someone that likes to tinker, I mean, I like to take control of almost every part of recording my guitars or whatever mm. and mixing them and stuff. But with something like that, it's kind of like, it's one job taken out of the chain of things that, to be honest, it's a job you need to do, but it's kind of unnecessarily takes too much time sometimes and you can end up getting hung up on it. Whereas, yeah, I like that. You end up what becoming I'm a producer is basically. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's the, uh, the thick cab. I think let's, let's go from thick to detailed. So detailed is on the same row as guttural and I put them together because those two are the two oldest. So those are the two 90s ones. As I say, the guttural is the oldest of the cabs. Detailed is another one from that kind of era. Um, and unlike guttural, it's a top speaker capture. So mm. it's got the more linear mid-range. But like guttural, it's got a more extended top. And I, I've often said that these older speakers resemble a greenback a little bit more. It's almost okay. like you blended in a little bit of greenback because they tend to have a more glassy, mm. fizzy, dare I say it, top end. Yeah. Um, and detailed, I've called it detailed because um, it's got, oh, this is difficult to put into words. That's just the word that came through to me. I felt like I was hearing lots of kind of nooks and crannies in the top end. It's quite complex, I guess. Right. Um, and this is probably another one where the Master EQ does have quite a big effect because stock, it's, um, it's on the brighter end of things, like a bit more spiky. Okay. But let's check it out. Again, this, this might be a good option for like earlier kind of prog style tones or I don't know. It's, it's great for loads of stuff. But, yeah. Um, yeah. Let's see. It's almost got like a kind of raspy yeah. character to it, I find. I was I was almost feeling like I was hearing more kind of stringiness about my guitar. Just such a great word. String you know stringiness. string definition from my <laughs> guitar, you know, just somehow there when you were when you were messing there. That's um, cool. I don't know if I just placed that in your mind by calling it detailed or, you could or have if done. it's real, but but I mean it's it's great. That that's what I think. You know, when I came up with a name, that's kind of what I felt. Like it was putting more emphasis on a like a different area of the spectrum. Yeah. Clear, it feels almost clearer in some sort of high mid, uh, upper mid range or something where the where the guitar string sort of sound for me naturally sounds or whatever. Yeah, it just sounded like it's a lot more open, a little clearer. Yeah, and and there's lots of professional metal producers that are using these really old cabs actually. Mm. Um, like I know of uh, like three or four off the top of my head whose main cabs are like from 
the early 90s. And again, it's not a character you can get any other way. So if you had, you know, if, if you had this cab and you were referencing recordings that were done with a cab that was closer to the, like the upfront and kind of massive era, which is mm. right at the beginning of the 2000s, you'd probably be quite frustrated. Like, I've got the same thing. It doesn't sound the same, you know? My theory of, like, I used to prefer older speakers is out the window now. Because you're like, the detailed one where I'm talking about it is one of the oldest drivers that, you, that you've got. So yeah. that in that, you know, completely debunks my... Uh, well, my theory. It's complicated, Thanks, though. And, and remember, <laughs> <laughs> remember that there's none uh, newer than 2004. Oh, okay. So I didn't know that. Yeah, it's like 16 years old, 17 year old uh, speakers is the the youngest one. They stopped making. No, it's just the voicing change. Right. And, okay. I, and I've done a video actually with uh, Christian Koller talking about the history of the Vintage 30 and the different voicing. So if you want to get really nerdy about it, you could watch that. Right. But in essence, forget about the Chinese UK thing. It's a bit of a red herring, a little bit. Um, it's just the voicing has changed over time. And, and my theory is that it's the, the way that the cones, like the formula of the cones, which is just made out of paper, mm. a paper pulp. And I think that's changed over the years. And it's very difficult to go back and make it like it was before, is right. my theory. Because I really don't think that Celestine have tried to change the voicing. I think this mm. is something which has evolved. Just from supply, supply chains and the type of materials they have access to, I guess. And presumably like manufacturing techniques and something. I'm, I'm sure mm. they're making them differently now than they were in 1989 when they started making the Vintage 30, you know, or 1987, I should say. Um, I'm sure it's just changed over time. And even visually, they look a little bit different. Yeah. You can notice differences. So the modern ones, they sound cool. Don't get me wrong. You can get good sounds out of them as long as they're broken in enough, which to, in my mind is a process which takes longer than 100 hours or whatever people say. Right. I don't think you notice that much difference in the first 100 hours, to be honest. Um, I'm talking about, you know, plenty of... of like solid use the main thing i've always felt with brand new cabs when you unbox them is they just sound harsh mm. they all just sound harsh and that's just the nature of new speakers yeah and that was something that you know no matter how expensive or good the speaker is doesn't matter it's you have to break them in they have to be broken in i mean so to that point the upfront cab i love so much mm. i had another one that was a few serial numbers away mm. i got it from a friend who actually works in the music industry but he's not a professional musician mm. and he's babied it since he got it right and it sounded too bright <laughs> for me it, it was it was like too new sounding like I, I actually ended up swapping it with um with josh from silosis right. architects he's got it now he's gonna sound good in a few years yeah, you know it's yeah. like me talking about wine again like yeah, it's got yeah, the yeah. potential but needs it, to mature yeah it needs, yeah it needs a bit of maturing yeah, yeah. Uh, and then it will probably sound just as good so you know that even with these old cabs if you get one that's been Mm. looked after too well it probably doesn't sound like you want it to yet yeah you know? give it a bit of abuse mm. it's crazy that all right so we've just got one cab left uh and this is another favorite of mine and it it kind of steps away a little bit from the voicings of these others because for me it's a, quite a smooth and warm sound mm -hmm. you can still be really aggressive um as a tidbit this cab is very similar in sound and serial number to a cab that belongs to a friend of mine that apparently Colin Richards had said was his favourite sounding Mesa Boogie cab of all time. Oh, okay. So this is this is like a he said she said thing. Okay. But it's definitely like um, a very usable sound for for rock and metal. But it's a smoother thing. It's really cool for leads actually. Okay. This one. Uh, so we'll come back to that in a little bit. But this is probably going to be another quite vivid difference as we go from detailed to smooth. So cool. Take it away. <laughs> I mean, that sounds killer. And to be yeah. honest, when you're playing, I surprised myself with how much I liked how it sounded all the way set to dark. Yeah. That actually was a super cool sound that I haven't necessarily spent Discovered much yet. time on. Yeah, yeah. So that's an interesting sound for me, for sure. It's, it's a really, really cool sounding cab, that one. I don't know. Did you, so you... far for me, that, the massive, and I think it's guttural are the ones that I've, that I've gone, make a mental note when you get home. Right. So you can have a little play. I think the cool thing is, and you know, we've had this beta tested by a few people. Mm. People tend to have strong feelings about this, and 
lots of people actually have come back being like, so is this different speaker, like different types of speaker yeah. and stuff. I think people have been generally shocked when they found out these are all V30s, all 412 angled Californian uh, cabs. You know? For me, it's going to be really interesting. When, so for example, I've been listening and going, right, high gain, I've got my go-tos, but it's like when you start going into pushed clean, when you start going into the really detailed, articulate vocal kind of guitar tones you know yeah that a v30 can supply all of what you'd need because you know there's that argument to say oh we need cream backs for this type of tone oh mm. we need you know alnica blues for this kind of tone but you know it'd be interesting to see what we get with essentially all v30s yeah and i mean for me there's one example that just puts paid to all of that which is andy timmons like for me he's once you step outside the world of metal tone, like there's just no one that gets better guitar tones, <laughs> yeah. as far as I'm concerned. And, and he uses yeah, fair play. these kinds of cabs. And I mean, he's known for using two twelves, but actually in the studio, he's quite often used four twelves as well um, with V thirties. And he gets closed back cabs as well. They're not like you know yeah. typical like kind of AC thirty style amps or something, or or like twins and stuff. And and he gets amazing clean. It's sounds. fair to say that Andy does get. I say it like I know him personally. Oh, Andy. Andy yeah. Timmons. Yeah. Andy yeah. T. Oh, Andy. Yeah. But yeah, no, in fairness to him, his tones are sublime. Yeah. Good old Mr. Andrew Timmons.